tough crowd tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. And I'm, and I'm here to help because uh, Neoranda has a large scale renewal of energy. Owner, operator, producer has got some answers actually to those questions. Uh, so I'm Megan Ward. I'm the state leader uh, for Neoranda here in South Australia, based in Canberra pretty much becoming a local, spending a lot of time here developing some projects that I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, and tonight I want to focus on Neowen's vision for renewables generally in Australia, but in particular to about how South Australia is driving that change. Uh, so, without further ado, Neowen, uh, no one can even say it the first time they look at it, French company, Neo, New and Energy, New Energy, that's what we're all about. We are uh, investing in large-scale wind, solar, batteries. That's our core business. And what differentiates us from others is that we don't just develop projects and move on, sell them to someone else to deal with the problems that they've created. We actually own them and operate them for their lifetime. So we're a long-term investor. That means, as well, that we can produce these projects at a low cost. We have investors that are willing to invest for the long term. A lot of European uh, investors have helped us with that. Uh, so we've already got nearly three gig of projects across uh, the globe, and a gig of that is in Australia, and a very large portion of that is right here in South Australia. Uh, and I've got a target up there of five gig by 2021. I'm going to present a project that's just going to blow that out of the water anyway. Fantastic. So here's what we've done. Um, and as I said, oh, right. South that's Australia is going to be part yeah. of that. So the Hornsdale wind farm uh, near Jamestown is 309 megawatts um, of large-scale wind. It's also co-located with what you might know as the Tesla big battery. That's ours, and I'll talk a little bit about how awesome that's been soon as well. Uh, but first, I wanted to have a little foray into what we see happening in the national market. So this is what the market looks like, it hasn't changed too much since 2017. There's comings and goings of which coal-fired power station is going to retire next. Uh, but nonetheless, this is pretty much what it's looking like. We've got a lot of coal uh, in New South Wales, it's really bad brown coal in Victoria, um, supplying our electricity needs. We've got little old South Australia uh, really punching above its weight there, bit of gas, heaps of wind, um, and that's what the, the mix currently looks like. But that's going to change, and it's not just changing because there's companies like Neowen uh, waiting for government handouts to deal with this big wind and solar. It's changing because our coal-fired power stations are retiring, and they're the ones that need big subsidies to come into existence these days. They're retiring um, some of them are looking for lifelines, some of them are not accepting lifelines to stay operating. Um, and this is what we're seeing. By you know, 2035, we're going to have more than half of the coal-fired power stations retiring out of our fleet. Not because someone's necessarily driving that, just that's the natural end of their life cycle. So that's problem one, opportunity one perhaps. Uh, and not only that, those coal fire power stations are becoming less available. So they're retiring, sure, because they're becoming old, but in fact they're becoming less and less effective, which is also driving problems within our system because we've come to rely on them. So problem slash opportunity number two. And also we're seeing a reduced availability slash increased cost of gas. Um, that's all being driven by LNG exports, um, which we've been obviously hearing a lot about in the media and whether or not we should have local reservations and so on. Um, but regardless of all of that, what we're seeing is the demand uh, in that red is just skyrocketing, right? So that is also driving anyone going back to Economics 101 an increase in the price which means that it's becoming more and more expensive for our gas fire generators to operate. And that's an interesting situation to be here in SA, where because of our supply mix, we've had to decide that we need to have gas fire generators on to keep the reliability of our supply here in South Australia. Which, you know, maybe that's, that's fair enough. That's the situation we're in right now. We've had to come up with a solution. 
South Australia has been uh, both benefiting and suffering from its leadership um, to date in renewables. Yes, sort of. So, here we are, where we are suffering because of an increase in price that's being driven by this gas policy. Um, whereby, if you've got a certain yeah. amount of, um, you need to always have some gas fire generators switched on right to maintain yeah. our life, basically. Uh, so, all right, so given all, that, all of that that's happened, forecast your mind uh, another 20 years or so, we're going to need to build another 29, or maybe even more, South Australia's to meet that gap and the change in generation uh, and supply that's going to be happening across the net. Sounds like an opportunity for someone like me, anyone else developing renewables in the, in the room. Uh, and in fact, there's been some analysis, and this is something we would agree with, that maybe what we need to be targeting is not 100% renewables, it's more like 200% renewables. Uh, and so certainly, SA has got a head start here uh, to capitalise on the knowledge that we have in the room, the expertise that we've been developing, given that we had this problem um, of the lights going out, uh, and we came up with some solutions to respond to that, which I'll talk about. So, given all of that, without really trying too hard, um, and without any particular push, obviously we've got um, policies racking up that are supporting uh, large-scale renewables, Regardless of anything that's happening, we're really on track to, for Australia to be 50% renewable um, in the next couple of years and 100% by 2032. Pretty cool. So how does South Australia capitalise on that opportunity? Well, we're already 50% renewable, so we've done that. And despite some government targets, I think there's a good chance that South Australia will be renewable ahead of the government's targets um, for 100% by 2030. What's driving that is the amazing natural resources that we have here in the state. And the thing that's going to allow us to move beyond 50%, which does seem to be the point at which systems struggle, is the fact that we have got this overlay of amazing wind and amazing solar, and it's happening at just the right times of day, and I'll talk a little bit about exactly how we see that working. There's not many other places in Australia where you get, get that really good overlay of excellent wind and excellent solar. So here's South Australia's na natural competitive advantage uh, right there. It's not enough though. Um, just being naturally talented doesn't always get you places. Sometimes you need a bit of help, right? So here we've also got a state government and I'll acknowledge as well that we've had strong leadership from one government to the next. So it hasn't changed. We haven't gone stuck in some kind of let's go back to, you know, the, the dark ages over here. We're just picking things up and moving on to the next thing. We're acknowledging the successes that we've already had and moving on. At the same time as well, government is not just providing a nice um, policy framework, but also providing direct financial support. Interesting question about Port Augusta. Probably don't have time to talk about it, but I'd love to have a chat to you about it later. Uh, so the government did step in and assisted uh, with the Hornsdale Power Reserve, better known as the Tesla Leaf Battery. Uh, this is our project, as I mentioned, it's 100 megawatts um, and it is co-located with our wind farm. Importantly, um, much of it, 70 megawatts, is reserved to deliver critical functions um, to stabilise the local grid and it's been delivering. The rest, the little 30 megawatts, we get to play with in the market. Uh, and so here is a real example and I encourage you to dig up this report and have, have a look, um, is a, an, an analysis of a real event um, late last year after the battery had been in operation for nine months or so. Um, it really demonstrated uh, the, the results that it could deliver for consumers here in South Australia. And this is a little known story, I guess, of the time the lights stayed on. Um, we all hear about the time the lights go out, but this time, probably you're going back day-to-day -day life and you didn't notice that um, 
New South Wales, Victoria, all <laughs> started shedding loan. South Australia, for the first time, was able to actually island from the rest of the network and continue operating. And the reason that that happened is that what's showing in this graph is that in the space of literally less than a minute, the battery, it went from sitting around, it was charging at the time, it got a, a signal to say that the frequency in the network had gone outside the limits that were allowed, which are those dotted lines that you can see there. Um, it was starting to dip be below that critical point of 49.8. And so the battery was like, all right, here we go. In less than the blink of an eye, it was responding, reacting, bringing that frequency back down. We then had another event, and so it was all set off by a lightning strike uh, in Queensland, which saw the Queensland interconnected trip. Um, then we had uh, another interconnected trip we went, all right, we'll, we'll go the other way, we'll start drawing power again. So this battery in, in less than a minute has single-handedly kept the lights on here in South Australia. Not a story we hear about a lot because it's not that exciting, I guess, the, the fact that the power system did exactly what it was meant to do. And the fact is that batteries can do this better than their counterparts in coal and gas um, who we've come to rely on we can follow any frequency signal faster than they can. And this is all happening whilst we are starting to erode the market share that these incumbents have created for themselves. So we've been saving consumers by getting in, chipping away, um, needing uh, less to, to, to be delivering these services. So saving $40 million in the first year of operation for SA consumers. Not $40 million that um, I've been making and uh, getting off to the Bahamas, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and in the interest of time, what I'm going to and then say, say that now we are looking at projects that bring all of this together. So, Crystal Brook um, Energy Park is a concept that combines wind, solar, and batteries to be able to deliver a firm power supply. That's obviously the next question is that's great but we do need our lights to be on all the time. So this is what we're now focused on, is how can you combine the natural advantage that you have here in South Australia with our learnings in technology to deliver a renewable energy supply 100% of the time. So we combine these resources, and as I said earlier, the important factor is not just that you have wind and sun, it's that you have it at the right times. Uh, in South Australia, we also have these excellent areas where it's windy in the morning and in the evenings and the sun is always sunny in the middle of the day. So we're able to combine that, meaning that you need less storage to be able to smooth out the gaps. So we're very focused on this and how that can start to bring down the cost of uh, electricity and importantly start to support new industries. So how do we attract new industries here in South Australia? We can do that by bringing down the cost of power. You're probably all very aware that South Australia has the highest electricity prices in the country. No. That's <laughs> not that attractive to someone trying to build an energy intensive industry. Uh, but like I said, uh, I'm from the UN and, and I'm here to help. So 40% uh, <laughs> lower the current electricity prices with this pretty small project really when it comes down to it. Uh, and we're going to support that with more uh, poles and wires. So the South Australian Government, Electronet, New South Wales are all working together to develop a project to also connect South Australia into New South Wales. Currently they're looking at is how great South Australia can get a bit more reliability from New South Wales. I'm looking at that in terms of why don't we just export this amazing resource that we have here in South Australia into New South Wales. That's going to drive prices down here and in New South Wales. Uh, so I think what we're going to see with this project is bigger projects coming on sooner, which is going to drive down prices ultimately for consumers. I get a lot of questions often about, from in my role in development, I'm talking to farmers, um, often signing up land and so on. Everyone still sort of thinks that high prices are being driven by renewables. And if you want to chat about that, I'm very happy to do that also. Uh, and so the last thing I wanted to chat about is the project we're calling the Goida Renewable Zone. 
if it's too big to be a park or something like that, it's really an excellent opportunity to show what renewables can do next. So this project at full potential, and it was announced uh, formally last week, could be two gig of wind, a gig of solar, 1.5 gig or so of batteries. The first stage um, is going to be a small component of that and can happen without the interconnector. Subsequent stages currently do rely on the interconnector. The strategy is build cheap renewables here in South Australia, export it into New South Wales. Unless someone would like to build a very large hydrogen plant here, which we would also be keen to do. Excellent. Lots of opportunities. Excellent. Uh, so, as I said, likely to build across many stages. Uh, it'll combine wind solar storage. Again, just taking that concept from earlier, making it bigger, making it cheaper. Uh, and so we're going to start replacing the functions that we're seeing of gas generators here, coal generators in New South Wales. And the last, the really last thing that I wanted to touch on, given where we are tonight, is the next place for renewables to also evolve into is to continue to learn and to grow as uh, contributors to the local economy. We've started doing that in a small way, uh, but we're starting to grow and, and discover really the benefits that renewables can deliver to local communities. It's quite amazing to be working on a project where you can actually involve 40 plus um, local families in the construction of the project. They get to own uh, the land that your infrastructure is on. They continue to own that while you're there. Will contribute to community funds. Obviously, there's a big boom of jobs, but then there is a, a long ongoing also local workforce, and we'll continue to work with council and programs to try and actually upskill locals to, to participate in those. Um, ongoing employment opportunities as well. So really the sky's the limit. We're in the consultation phase for Goiter at the moment, seeking feedback um, from locals in terms of what they would like to see supported. We've got a really big opportunity here to continue to contribute to the community, given that as a company, we own and operate these assets for their 30 plus year life, lifespan. So my parting message, Future renewables are cheap. We're just going to replace the function out with the old, in with the new, powering new industries and also delivering real community benefits. So I'm proud to stand next to somebody who knows that size really does matter. <laughs> and I want to start the questions with you already have the largest battery in the world. Is that what you want to do with Goida, is keep the title? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's very important to me personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, it's, it's not uh, just about bigger is better, but honestly, I guess what we're seeing is that the reality is you can't go to 100% renewables without something else there to back it up. This is probably not going to be the biggest battery forever, but uh, we'll, we'll keep trying to hold that title for as long as we can. Well, I think Hornstar Power Reserve still holds the title, it does, does it not? It does. I think there's a couple of batteries going on in the United States which are going to take the title once they finish in the end of 2020, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. But if you were to build that 1.5 gigawatt battery, that would take it back. Yeah, I think we might say a little bit more. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, you briefly touched on uh, potential for hydrogen as a form of power generation when you touched on border. Mm. Do you want to expand on the potential for hydrogen? I do. So actually we did a lot of work looking at the opportunity for hydrogen at Crystal Brook as well. Again, applying this concept if you've actually got a pretty stable power supply and you can also um, at the same time trade in the market to capitalise on high market price events, have this flexible load to deliver hydrogen, um, there's a really good opportunity there. So probably from our point of view, perhaps where we see hydrogen go going is not so much as um, converting back to, to generate electricity, but potentially for future exports. Um, there's certainly a lot of growing interest um, to some of our surrounding neighbours, Japan, Korea, Singapore, in importing a, an energy supply um, that is clean, green, and not susceptible in the same way that, say, an undersea cable would be to interference. So, 
be able to have a network of hydrogen supplied on ships could potentially be very attractive. Something that they're working on and something that our focus is, generally speaking, how cheap can we make this electricity? Because the cheaper you can make the electricity, the cheaper you can make the hydrogen. That's really all it comes down to. It's pretty much influenced um, by electricity price, you know, whether or not you have parts and come. These are the, the key things that, that drive whether or not hydrogen is going to be successful. I think there's certainly a lot of buzz growing that. Definitely something that we're following closely. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of challenges in, in uh, getting an international supply chain happening. Hi, Chris Ryan, how are you? Good. Uh, I often see the wholesale price go negative. What sort of opportunities do you see there? Yeah, charging batteries, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> no, it's, a, it's certainly a challenge, right? Where the entire industry is looking negative pricing in the middle of the day um, for solar. So definitely that's another case for, for batteries. It's another case for being able to sell a firm product, right? This is why we need, it's not just that we're doing this out of the goodness of our hearts, it is a business strategy as well, right? We're trying to develop a product that we think will be attractive to new players like the industry. Government PPAs and so on are a thing of the past. We need to actually just be getting out there and competing with the incumbents and being able to provide a product that's going to be attractive to people that need a lot of electricity. Any more questions? Yes. Um, just one between SM6 being concerned with their resource industry. Is there any argument you're going into that? And is the question that out? Sorry. Sorry, can you explain that further? It's a gas that's used, uh, in the community, energy, it's a um, coating that's applied to um, electrical plants and uh, stabilize it against fire and such. So uh, it's a gas and it causes more damage to the environment than anything else out there. You know, you can, apparently, the bigger you can see, get, the worse the gas is. Uh, I wonder if you've heard about it. It's, it's, uh, anyway, I don't know if yeah, well, personally. As obviously as these technologies evolve, we do unfortunately discover side effects. Sorry, maybe I can ask that question, so I don't know. Oh, there you go, thank you. Jeff's here, Jeff's here, you're out there. Yeah, thank you. 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 Yeah, thank you.